Next up is uh, Jeremy Wilson. Uh, geometric morphometrics reveal sister species in sympatry and decline in genital morphology in a ghost spider genus. Thanks. Um, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yeah, it looks like you need to share, you know, put it in PowerPoint yep. mode or show mode, but yeah, looks good. Now? Is that, that's good. Looks great. Great. Um, thanks, Michael. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm presenting here from uh, in the early hours of the Australian morning uh, in a hotel, a quarantine hotel. Uh, and I'm going to present some work that I did uh, over the last two years during my postdoc in, in Argentina in the team of Martin Ramirez with, uh, with colleagues in, in Argentina and in Chile. Um, if any of you were at the Latin American Congress last year, you would have already seen uh, this presentation. But don't worry, this time I'm, you don't have to put up with my mediocre Spanish. I'm going to stick with Australian. <laughs> Uh, so we, we, we did a study on a, a species group from uh, the southern cone of South America that's been uh, that's had ambiguous boundaries between species in the past. And we used geometric morphometrics along with traditional morphology and uh, and molecular phylogenetics to uh, clarify those boundaries. So. These days, it's, uh, it's quite common when you're dealing with a, a difficult species group, a difficult taxonomic problem, to use an integrative approach, uh, combining multiple lines of evidence to test your, your species hypotheses. Um, normally, that involves using sort of more traditional morphological methods of, of looking at hundreds of, of specimens and finding diagnostic features just by eye, uh, and then Often that's com combined with a molecular approach where we test whether those groups that we identify uh, are monophyletic. Uh, however, you can also uh, augment the morphological side of the analysis using uh, methods like geometric morphometrics. And what I found that this method could do is if you have a, a particular feature in your group that you know is uh, taxonomically informative, uh, but has a lot of variation, uh, subtle variation, you can really tease apart the intra and interspecific variation and visualize that variation in a way that I, I don't think you can match looking at specimens one at a time. And that's what I want to show with, with this talk. So we wanted to apply this method to uh, the Sanagasta maculatipus species group. Uh, it's a group of enophanids from the southern cone of South America, and it contains three species. Sanagasta alticola, Sanagasta mandibularis, and Sanagasta maculatipus. Uh, on the right, you can see illustrations from Martin Ramirez's 2003 revision, uh, illustrations of the female genitalia. And what I want you to notice here, if you can see my cursor, is uh, that the, the variation between species uh, is, is in, well, one of the major diagnostic features is the height of this uh, pouch in, in the median field. Uh, it's high in Senegasta alticola, well, further away from the, from the epigastric furrow, low in mandibularis, and then intermediate in, in maculatipus. Uh, in this revision, Martin pointed out that the boundaries between these species were, were somewhat ambiguous uh, and it needed to be clarified. And in fact, in, in his illustrations of maculatipus, he illustrated two variants uh, of of the female genitalia, uh, which although that the pocket is at about the same, the pocket or pouch is at about the same level, we can see uh, in these illustrations that it looks like the internal genitalia is, is slightly different or the internal part of the genitalia. Uh, so we wanted to uh, clarify that. We knew that the female genitalia was taxonomically informative, but that the boundaries were ambiguous uh, and the, the female genitalia, because it's a somewhat two-dimensional structure, it, it lends itself well to geometric morphometrics. So we wanted to use landmark-based geometric morphometrics to uh, clarify those boundaries, to identify if there were any uh, cryptic species within the group. Uh, and we combined that with a multi-locus phylogenetic analysis, uh, basically to put the findings of the morphological analysis in a phylogenetic context. So we began by looking at every specimen in the museum uh, and uh, identifying them to the level of, of, of the current species using Martin's uh, revision. 
And you can see in the map where we found specimens of each species, where they, where they come from. So San Augusta alticola is found in, in the Andes mountain range in northwestern Argentina and up into Bolivia. Uh, San Augusta mandibularis in the blue uh, comes from north of, of, of Buenos Aires in the riverine region of, of Argentina. And San Augusta maculatipis is, is incredibly widespread. It's in the orange. And you can see it, it occurs through the entire southern cone, uh, as well as with disjunct populations up in, in Bolivia and Peru, and also on Easter Island, which is over 3,000 kilometres uh, off the coast of Chile. So after identifying all the specimens to, to species, to the current species, uh, we then wanted to divide San Agasta maculatipis further because it's the most variable and widespread species, and it's the one that we suspected might contain cryptic species. So we identified four subgroups that we wanted to test further using geometric morphometrics. Two of those corresponded to Martin's two illustrations. And you can see that, uh, well, hopefully you can see that the variation between them is in, in the, the sort of form of the copulatory duct. Uh, both of those occur uh, throughout a large range throughout Argentina and Chile, uh, and they actually occur in the same, they're, they're sympatric through a large portion of their range. Uh, and then there were two other subgroups that we wanted to test because they represent disjunct populations. One on Easter Island. Uh, this is not to scale, by the way, Easter Island is actually a lot further away from the continent. Uh, and actually those ones from Easter Island morphologically looked a little different at the beginning of this study because this pocket here is a little bit higher than it is in the mainland species, uh, mainland populations. And there's also this northern population which appears to be disjunct and specimens from this population also seem to be in general bigger. So we wanted to test whether the, there were cryptic species within San Augusta maculatipus using these subgroups. So having identified those species and subgroups, we chose exemplar females from throughout the range of each. We dissected off the female genitalia, cleared it and photographed it, and then placed landmarks on the images using TPS software. Uh, we used both traditional landmarks, which are, are, are placed on, on points, relatively homologous points that can be identified in all specimens. But we also use pseudo landmarks, which are used to represent uh, homologous curves, and we use those to, to represent the curvature of the spermatheca. We then imported the data into R, uh, and we uh, performed a bunch of uh, analyses, sort of preliminary analyses first to prepare it for, for shape analysis. So we performed a, a generalized Procrustes analysis, which is basically the superimposition, superimposition uh, process where you remove variation in size, uh, position and, and rotation and leave only shape variation. Uh, then we performed a, a correction for, we removed the asymmetrical component from, from the data. And we did that basically because uh, to remove potential errors during photography if, if the genital plate was at a slight angle. And then we performed a, a correction, an allometric correction, taking out the, the proportion of shape variation that uh, is correlated with size, the change in size. Uh, about 10 minutes. Oh, wow. That was quick. Uh, so then we performed a principal component analysis uh, to view, to look at whether our groups uh, were uh, clustered in morphospace and a canonical variance analysis to look at whether the groups were objectively identifiable. So looking first at, at the currently described species, we can see in the PCAs that uh, each forms a relatively distinct cluster, both before and after uh, the allometric correction, a little less after. And we found in the CVA analysis that the current species were uh, objectively identifiable based on the shape data at a relatively high rate. Looking at our results uh, at, within the, between subgroups in San Augusta maculatipis, we found that the two subgroups identified based on shape, morphotype 1 and morphotype 2, were always distinct clusters in morphospace. Uh, however, the Easter Island population clustered with morphotype 2, we can see them here, and the northern population clustered with morphotype 2 after the allometric correction, and we can see that here. Um, 
And the CVA analysis also revealed that, that these two groups, once those two uh, disjunct populations had been combined with the two morpho morphological groups, uh, those two remaining groups were, were objectively identifiable at a high accuracy, 98% accuracy. We also uh, performed a Procrustes uh, ANOVA to look at covariation with longitude uh, in one of the two morphotypes, morphotype two, because we, we saw while doing these analyses that there seemed to be a change in the height of this, this pocket or pouch in the, in the median field. And we found that in fact, there was a, a, a covariation between longitude and, and shape, which corresponded with uh, an increase in the height of this pocket from east to west, uh, with the Easter Island population being uh, the same as the Chilean populations with the very high pocket. And the phylogenetic analysis revealed basically uh, the same patterns, which is always nice. So we found that currently described species were all monophyletic groups. Uh, and then within macula typus, we had uh, two reciprocally monophyletic groups uh, corresponding to each morphotype. And then in morphotype two, which is in yellow here, we had an Eastern and a Western uh, representative, which showed the two different uh, morphologies associated with East and West. And they're basically identical genetically. So this confirms to us that that difference is not uh, is not actually uh, between two species. It's just intraspecific variation, an intraspecific climb. So just to sum up, uh, we we showed using this method that uh, we could, we clarified the boundaries between the current species, and we were also able to identify uh, these two uh, cryptic species within Sanagaster macula typus, morphotype one and two which overlap in their range through a large portion of Argentina. Uh, and I guess the, the main takeaway from this is that this is quite a complex system uh, with overlapping ranges, intraspecific variation. Uh, and you can take it from me that when, I, when you first approach the group, it, it's very difficult to, to, to see these patterns, but geometric using geometric morphometrics really allowed us to tease those patterns apart uh, and visualize them and understand them to a, to a much higher level. Uh, and then this is leading on to, to other studies or, or contributing to other studies. So some of you may have seen the talk by Dante Poi, I think it was this morning, uh, where he's looking at the interaction of this pocket in the females with the paramedian apophysis in the males. And so now knowing about that interaction, as well as knowing uh, that there's this climb in the, in the, in the height of the pocket, um, we can ask all sorts of questions in future. Uh, for example, is there a, a, a corresponding client in the males? Uh, and with that, I'm going to finish. I, I want to say thank you so much to, to everyone in the lab uh, in Argentina. I had a fantastic time uh, in Argentina. I learned a lot uh, and had a great time in the field. Thanks to everyone who was, who was involved in that study that I just showed, um, and to anyone who, who contributed funding to myself or to the other co-authors to do field work. Thanks so much, and I'll, um, I'll finish with that. Great. You know, I, I told you 10 minutes just a little bit early, Jeremy, so we actually do have a little bit of time. If anybody oh, well, has great. a question, I, <laughs> I don't see any questions. I, had, I see a lot of great comments, but not questions in the chat. So. Um, last call. Otherwise, I think we'll move on. Um, thanks, Jeremy. I really appreciate it.